Hi everyone and welcome back. My name is Sergio Gabor and I'm a quality engineer in the automotive industry. Today I have to change the chain and sprockets on my bike. So this video is just about that. We're not going to test anything, but I'll show you the process I'm going through when troubleshooting, changing, choosing these components and of course maintaining them. We'll first start with a little troubleshooting guide to faulty chains or sprockets. Then we'll move on to chain adjusting, what to buy, chain installation and general maintenance. If you're interested in just one of these steps or just want to skip a step, the play bar down below is divided into chapters so you can watch exactly what you need. Let's get started. So last year I started to hear some noise coming from my chain, which is a good indication that it needs to be changed, but it can also indicate other problems. Listen to this. Hear that cranking noise? The chain should not be making this sound. So either it needs replacing or needs adjusting. No matter what you're trying to fix, you always start by eliminating the cheapest and easiest possible issue. And a simple visual inspection is the cheapest way to understand what's wrong. Looking over the chain, I cannot see any obvious problems like excessive rust, missing rollers or kinks. Next, let's take a look at the sprockets. The front one looks a bit worn out. You can see that the teeth are bent back a little. For your reference, here's the difference between a new and used sprocket. Other possible issues with the sprocket can be missing teeth, corrosion or excessive wear. Also, the retainer nut should be snug and no play should be present in the drive shaft. As for the rear sprocket, you should look out for the same issues. In my case, you can easily see that the sprocket is worn out. If up to this point everything looks okay to you, let's check the chain service limit. As tension is constantly being applied to your chain, this can stretch over time and needs to be adjusted using the two adjusters on the rear axle. But you can only adjust it to a certain point after which a replacement is required. So what you need to do is to measure the distance between a certain number of links. In order to do this properly, you need to put tension on the chain using the chain adjusters before you measure, but because that would mess up the chain slack adjustment, I'll first mark the original position so I know where to bring it back if everything's okay. The chain is now under tension and for my bike I need to count 21 pins and measure the distance between them. The service limit should be 319.4 millimeters. Well, according to this ruler, it's 323 millimeters, so this chain clearly needs to be replaced. Anyway, if your chain is still within the service limit, let's make sure that it's properly aligned and has the necessary slack. The alignment is pretty straightforward to perform, as the rear wheel can be adjusted using the two sliders on both sides of the swing arm. If these two sliders are out of alignment, both your rear wheel and sprocket will be crooked, increasing the wear and making your riding experience pretty shitty. <laughs> so to check this, you can use a ruler, but a caliper is recommended. Most bikes have some markings on the swing arm to help you with this adjustment, but I find this a bit unreliable. However, using a caliper, the values are more accurate and the alignment should be better. In order to adjust it, you first need to loosen the axle nut and the adjustment lock screws after which we can align the wheel as it can now move forward or backward. But you may be wondering, how much should I move the wheel? <laughs> well, great question. The rear wheel needs to be adjusted depending on the chain slack. So the chain slack or chain tension refers to how much the chain can move up and down between the two sprockets. And this needs to be adjusted according to a service manual. Some manufacturers recommend doing this with the rider on the motorcycle, while others recommend doing it with the bike on the side stand. I highly recommend using the method mentioned in the manual because the adjustment values are set to that exact measuring method. And by doing it differently, you'll mess up the adjustment. Now, using a ruler, measure how much the chain moves up and down. On my bike, the slack should be between 20 and 30 millimeters. If the slack is over the limit, move the wheel backward. If it's under, move the wheel forward. You get the idea. Once the slack is set, tighten the real axle nut and adjustment screws and measure again the alignment and the slack so everything is okay. I hope this helps you find the problem, but if it does not, then you need to investigate further. 
check the wheel bearings, dampeners and axle, as well as the brake calipers and discs. However, the issue might also be related to the gearbox. Ok, so now that we know that the chain and sprockets are shot, what do we buy? As there are a lot of options available. Well, first of all, always replace both chain and sprockets as a set. That's a rule. By not doing this, the new part will wear out prematurely. In short, the main parameters you need to look out for is the chain size, the number of links and the number of teeth on both sprockets. Luckily, in most cases, this information is stamped on the old parts. You can see here that my chain size is 525 and my brackets have a tooth count of 17 in the front and 41 in the rear. As for the number of links, you can always count them or search for this information in the service manual. Other than that, there are still a lot of other options to choose from, like the sprocket type, the brand, the master link type, sealed or unsealed, sealing type and surface treatment. So let's briefly go over some of them. Besides the tooth count, rear sprockets can come in steel or aluminum. Always go with the steel option, especially for street riding. Aluminum wears out a lot quicker and it's mostly used on dirt bikes. There are also hybrid sprockets, but these have a higher price. The front sprocket mostly comes only in steel, with some having a rubber lining to reduce noise. When it comes to the brand, I highly recommend going for established brands. A higher price usually means better quality. Cheap chains are cheap for a reason and usually imply lower quality alloys, bad surface treatments and sloppy tolerances. The master link or connection link is what binds your chain together and there are two types, a rivet type and a clip type. A rivet type should be more secure, but you'll need a special riveting tool to install it. A clip type uses a clip that slides over the pins to secure it in place. These are arguably less secure as the clip can pop off, but honestly, I've used clip master links for a very long time and I didn't have any problems with them. I guess it all depends on your riding style. Now, just like the master link, sealing comes in two flavors. Sealed chains or unsealed chains. And you may be wondering, what the heck is this guy talking about? Well, sealed motorcycle chains have rollers on each pin. These rollers are not a solid piece of metal. They have a bushing on the inside and between each roller and bushing, the space is filled with grease from the factory and this maintains lubrication on the chain. So, in order to keep this lube inside, manufacturers used different types of gaskets. These gaskets are round, similar to a ring, hence the name O-ring. Uh, but my chain is X-ring or Z-ring or what's up with that? Well, it's still a ring, but the cross section is different, as you can see here. An unsealed chain does not have this gasket and the lube on the inside, so they require constant lubrication. My recommendation is to go with a sealed type as they last longer and do not really need lubrication. More about that later. As for the O-ring versus X-ring versus whatever, I couldn't see any difference between them. For the surface treatment, there are two types, plated and raw. Plated chains are more corrosion resistant because they have a nickel chrome layer or some other coating to prevent corrosion. Raw chains do not have this layer and can rust pretty quickly, but are cheaper. I would go for the plated option, but if the difference in price is substantial, a raw option is always okay. Just apply a little more oil. Great. Now that we know what to buy, let's go ahead and replace these parts. The tools you'll need are listed here, and the basic order of operation is listed here. As a precaution, I always compare the old parts with the new ones before I install them. This way you don't waste time installing the wrong parts and you can have it replaced. Once you install it, you might not be able to replace it and you're stuck with it. So the front sprocket needs to be loosened first. This is secured very tightly and you'll probably need to apply the rear brakes in order to remove it. But for now, don't remove it completely. Great, now that the nut is loose, we need to remove the chain. If you have a rivet master link, you need to use a riveting tool to remove it. Or you can just cut it off. If you have a master link type, this is much easier.
Now with the chain off we need to remove the rear wheel and change the sprocket. While doing this, it's always a good idea to check your bearings, dampeners and wheel axle for any issues. Once this is done, we can put the tire back on, but don't tighten the bolts just yet, because we need to adjust the chain slack and alignment. Now we can remove the front sprocket completely and have it replaced. However, we need to torque it to a required specification, so the chain needs to be installed in order to keep it from spinning using the rear brakes as we did earlier. With the sprocket off, now it's a good time to check if there's any play in the drive shaft. If any play is present, you should investigate further. With that done, place the new chain on the sprockets and have the two ends come together on the rear sprocket. Now let's prepare the master link. Apply the included lube on the pins and slide it on the new chain. Also, don't forget about the o-rings. In order to rivet the pins, you'll need a special tool designed for this. Each tool is different, so check the tool instructions on how to use it properly. With this tool, we are just deforming the exposed pins in order to lock them in place. If you choose a clip master link, you don't need this tool. A simple set of pliers will do the trick. So, with the chain on, apply the rear brake and torque the front sprocket to the required specification. With everything installed, align the wheel and set the chain tension as explained earlier. And with that, we are done. Just listen to what a difference this makes. But. In order to keep your new chain in good working condition, there are a few things to do as preventive maintenance. No matter what you're working on, it's always a good idea to mark each nut and bolt with some paint. This way, with just a quick look, you will be able to see if something's loose. After your first ride with the new chain, double check the chain alignment and tension as new parts sometimes need a bit of riding to fall properly in place. These adjustments are the most crucial when it comes to chain wear. If left unattended, your new chain and sprockets will wear out a lot quicker. Now, regarding cleaning and lubing, I believe that's a bit overrated. Hear me out. The service manual on all the bikes I've personally owned recommended cleaning the chain with kerosene and applying heavyweight motor oil. However, the chain manufacturer does not recommend cleaning with kerosene, 
but for lubrication they mention that transmission oil is okay. Other brands tell us to use a specific product for this purpose, usually made by the same brand. Yeah, <laughs> as I said, applying oil to a chain only helps to prevent corrosion, as the main components that need lubrication already have it within the roller. But anti-corrosion plating already prevents this to a certain degree. However, cleaning the chain is much more important as this layer of oil traps a lot of dirt and other nasty stuff. So do it, I guess, but don't overdo it because it's just a waste of money. Personally, I only clean the chain when I'm washing my bike, maybe two or three times per season. Using a brush and chain cleaner, I remove the dirt and grime, after which I dry it out and apply high viscosity engine oil. Of course, I remove all the excess with a dry cloth. So that's been it, my guide on motorcycle chain maintenance. If you found this information useful, hit that like button and let me know if I missed anything. I'm not a qualified technician and I mostly do basic maintenance on my bike and car as a hobby, but I've been doing it for a very long time. <laughs> Someone once told me that being a good mechanic requires 80% logic and 20% skill. Yeah, sounds about right. <laughs> Anyway, until next time, thank you very much for watching and have a great day. Bye-bye.